welcome to PCAM Help once again. This is John, but today I'm not alone. Got my puppy dogs with me. Yeah, so they're not going to be a lot of help. That's fine. Today, we're going to be looking at five steps to help you solve problems in quantum mechanics. We're going to be applying those five steps to deriving the solutions to the particle in the box. Okay? She's ready. Let's go to the digital whiteboard. So solving problems in quantum mechanics means finding solutions to the Schrodinger equation. By now you've probably seen, or at least you are aware of, such systems as the particle in a box, the harmonic oscillator, a potential well or barrier, a hydrogen atom, etc. The main difference between all of these different types of systems is the potential field the particle is in. The boundary conditions you apply to the system will also influence the solution as well. Follow these five steps to solve any quantum mechanical system. Step number one, define the potential. This is the potential that applies to, say, the particle in a box, or the hydrogen atom, or the harmonic oscillator. Define that first. Once you have the potential, solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation. This will give you general solutions, with which then you can apply boundary conditions to get more specific solutions. Once you have those, you can normalize your wave function solutions. And finally, you can find any constants or anything else left to do with the system. Okay, so remember those five steps. We're going to apply these five steps today to finding the solutions to the particle in a box. This is probably one of the most famous uh, problems in quantum mechanics. So if we take step number one, we have to define the potential. Okay, I'm going to start actually with a drawing. Okay, the particle is in a box, right? So uh, it has sides where the potential goes to infinity, and we'll say the box is a one-dimensional box with dimensions uh, x dimension from 0 to L. Okay, and inside the box, potential is 0. There are no forces acting on our particle, which is inside the box. The potential is infinity, otherwise, so anywhere outside of this box. Okay, number one is done. Sweet, let's move on to step two. The time independent Schrodinger equation. Okay, this you should probably be familiar with. You've probably seen it. Okay, and then we apply this to a wave function. Okay, so the difference, as you can see, between different types of systems will be in this potential term right here. Okay? But our particle is inside the box, somewhere in here, right? And inside the box, the potential is zero. So this term is actually going to go away for our solutions today. Therefore, the time-independent Schrodinger equation simplifies and rearranges to a nice, familiar-looking, second-order differential equation. All right, and now the right-hand side is all constants back times the wave function. So we're going to group all of them together, and this stuff we will call k squared. And a little bit of foreshadowing, uh, knowing kind of what our solutions are going to be, we'll call it k squared, all right, in anticipation of the solutions. So now... 
we have that the second derivative is equal to minus k squared times the function again. Okay, the solutions to this differential order equation are well known. They come up again and again in physical chemistry. You need to make sure this is well known to you. Okay? In words, what we have here is a function with which you take the second derivative and you end up with that function back again times a constant squared with a negative sign out front. Okay? Of course, the type of solutions generally to this uh, differential equation are complex exponentials or sines and cosines. And in each of these cases, there would be some coefficients that we'd have to figure out. Okay. Uh, and these are equivalent, so we can choose to work with whichever one is easier. In this case, we choose sines and cosines, and so we now have a general solution that our wave function is a cosine kx plus b sine kx. Okay, if you're not quite sure how these are solutions to that differential equation, make sure you take a, look, a closer look at that. Remember, you take the derivative twice, and you end up with negative k squared back times the function again. Okay, so now we have a general solution. We're ready to move on to step three in solving problems in quantum mechanics, which is applying boundary conditions. Okay, when the potential is infinity, the wave function has to go to zero. Because if the potential is infinity, then there's absolutely no probability of finding the particle in that region. So, psi wave function is zero. So now we know that uh, psi of zero, where the wave function goes to infinity, equals psi of L, and both of those have to equal zero. We're also taking into account here that the wave function has to be smooth. The first derivative has to be uh, continuous. And so as we approach zero and approach L, the wave function has to go to zero. All right, let's... Uh, Take a look at this first one here. So at psi zero, our solution is a cos zero plus b sine zero, and that has to be equal to zero. Well, sine of zero is zero, and cos of zero is one. So now we just determine that a must be zero. And our solutions have just been reduced to sine functions. Cool. Looking at the other uh, boundary, psi of L, we now have just B sine KL, and that has to equal zero. So there are two options here. Either B can be zero or sine KL can be zero. Well, if B is zero, then our wave function is zero everywhere, and we have no wave function, and we have no particle. So we're going to go ahead and say that's not correct, because we are assuming that there is a particle somewhere in here. So that means sine KL must equal zero. Well, we know something about sine functions. We know that uh, integer multiples of pi, sine is also zero. Right here where n is integers. Therefore, KL must equal and pi and k is n pi over l. Now, psi of x indexed by n's is b sine n pi x over l. And we are completed uh, step three. So step four we need to normalize now, and we'll find b this way. Okay, remember briefly that the square of the wave function is a probability density, and integrating this over a region gives a probability of finding a particle in that region. For this interpretation of the wave function to make any sense, if we look over all possible space, the probability 
must be 1. That is, if we look at all space of the wave function squared, that must be 1. Okay, so we can plug in our wave function here and we'll bring the b squared out front because it's a constant and we'll look from negative infinity to positive infinity and psi squared then it would be sine squared and pi x over l and this is going to be equal to 1 okay. uh, all space of course is negative infinity to infinity but we know that our wave function is 0 uh, at x values less than 0 and greater than l so our limits here can be changed from uh, negative infinity to infinity to 0 to l and we can also use a trig identity and rewrite our sine squared here knowing that sine squared theta is one half one minus cosine of two theta. Okay, so we're going to plug that in, and moving forward with the integral after those substitutions, we get b squared over two times l minus two n pi over l times the sine of two n pi x over l. We're going to evaluate that from 0 to l. And the result will equal 1. So the sine function will actually result in 0 in both limits. And so we're going to have a pretty simple result in the end that uh, b squared l over 2 equals 1. So b equals root 2 over l. Okay. Now, finally, we have our final wave function solutions. Indexed by quantum number n, we have psi sub n of x root 2 over l times sine n pi x over l. All right, those are the solutions to the particle in a box. And I say solutions because we have n, where n can take any integer value, uh, and so we have an infinite number of solutions. Okay, now finally, the last thing we want to do today is find any constants. And we're going to be looking at the energy in this case. Okay, so recall k. We defined k at the beginning as root 2 m e over h bar. And then as we were solving, we also found that k was n pi over l. Okay, so we can take these two equations now and solve for e fairly easily to be n squared pi squared h bar squared over 2 m l squared. And actually you'll often see this as n squared h squared over 8 m l squared where h and h bar have been swapped. Okay, that's probably the most common one. Nice work. You've just completely solved everything for the particle in a box problem, the most commonly asked potential on an exam. And to think a little bit about what this actually means, look here at this energy, right, that it's indexed by n, and uh, so the energy is quantized. And this is actually quite a remarkable result that we've come across only in quantum mechanics. All right? Remember these five steps, and you can apply them to any system. Good luck.